Hello. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the, uh, the warm introduction. Um, I'm going to share some ideas with you this morning um, <clears throat> about a pathway for creating and maintaining regenerative urban places. The world is becoming increasingly urban. For instance, in the United States, there are two threats that have happened in a while. One, an increase in population growth, and secondly, an expansion of metropolitan areas. If, for example, you take 1960, uh, the population then was 100, almost 179, of which 112 were located in metropolitan areas, making up 60. If you look at 2010, that population is 308, um, of which 83%, of almost 84%, was located in our metropolitan areas. And if indeed the hinterlands provide uh, many of the resources needed by urban areas, then it is very, very significant in terms of what is happening. If you bring it closer home to um, Texas, you look at the three, uh, three major metropolitan areas in Texas, and look at the population growth. If you look at uh, Austin, over the past, <clears throat> over the past um, 40 years, Austin, Texas, or 50 years, has grown by 324% followed by Houston. And this trend is worldwide. The 2010 estimates of, uh, of population by United Nations shows, for example, North America at 347 million. Look at Africa, 1 billion. Asia, 4.16. And Europe, 740. <clears throat> It is estimated that in 2050, the population of North America will grow to about 446. But look at Africa, three, almost 2.4 billion. Asia, 5.1. And Europe shrinks a little bit. So essentially, we have different sets of problems in some areas where we're uh, finding um, uh, rapid growth, in other areas we're finding shrinking growth. <coughs> And when we look at this population dynamics and look at other forces of change that range from globalization to uh, climate change, we we'll find that the primary challenge is really how to accommodate this growing population because the place increased burden on landscapes to accommodate our daily needs for food, fiber, work, and shelter. Urban growth presents a lot of opportunity, but also presents a number of problems. For example, it modifies physical conditions, disrupts the flow of energy, mineral, materials, and information across the landscape mosaic. It intensifies and disrupts hydrological cycle. It creates landscape fragmentation, which is widely regarded as uh, one of the major uh, sources of erosion of biological diversity. It depreciates aesthetic properties of landscapes. Globalization intensifies placelessness. And increasingly, we're beginning to know more about the uh, adverse effects of uh, climate change. A lot of solutions have been proposed to deal with these problems over time. I, I find that Emily Talley's classification of trying to categorize them in terms of the uh, specificity or whether it is linked to an existing urban area. So four different types of intervention pan out. One, incrementalism, which is the area where most of us are actually working, you know, whether it's an urban plaza, whether it's a greenway plaza, whatever it is, you know. But those are small incremental changes in the urban fabric. Client communities. <clears throat> that really ideas about how to manage growth at outskirts of cities. Mm -hmm. Urban
urban design, basically the key is that it is comprehensive. Take, for example, Miller, Texas, here in Austin, is an example of what I'm talking about. Or regionalism, trying to place settlements in the original context. The, through the uh, efforts of uh, Olmsted, uh, Gaddis, Marquette, and McCall. Um, but in as much as many solutions have been proposed, it, they're becoming difficult to obtain because urban systems are actually very complex systems. And we're only beginning to know how they operate, thanks to some of the work that's currently being done, long-term ecological studies <coughs> in, uh, <coughs> um, in our surrounding one in Arizona, and some of the work that's been done in, uh, uh, in the Puget Sound. We are beginning to know more about it. So essentially, we can conceptualize the challenge as such that trying to find those spatial structures and design that will enable us to address all those range of things that I've talked about, from unprecedented change to placelessness, and more importantly, being able to ensure that whatever solutions we propose will continue to be sustainable. So this leads to some of our questions. How can we create livable, healthy, and sustainable places <laughs> that are resilient? And how can we ensure that these places will continue to be resilient over time? <clears throat> and how can we ascertain that the quality and integrity of these urban landscapes uh, will, they will continue to maintain and serve as life support systems and do not deteriorate over time? So essentially, what we're talking about here is a search, a search for a pathway for creating and maintaining adaptive regenerative places. Um, in 1973, uh, ecologist Crawford Hollis produced a very important work, Resiliency and Stability of Ecological Systems, in which he brought about new thinking about the behavior of ecological systems. He identified there are two important qualities in trying to understand uh, ecological, uh, the, the, how they perform. One of them is resilience that determines the persistence of relationships within a system. Essentially, it is the ability of these systems to absorb change and still persist. So, so resilience is a feature of the system and, um, um, and being a persistence becomes the output of that particular system. The second one is the stability, and this is the ability of the system to return to its equilibrium state after a temporary disturbance. The more rapidly it returns to tout a lot of uh, frustrations, the more stable it is. As a matter of fact, this definition of stability is what traditionally ecologists and even designers and planners view upon because they want to create a, a landscape that are stable. And, and he went on to suggest that the extent to which we place emphasis on either resilience or stability has ramifications for the types of approach we adopt. For example, a focus on resilience will emphasize that we will try to create systems that are open, adaptable, that are transformative. Why, for example, an emphasis on, on stability will focus on maintaining the structure and function of ecosystems and make, making sure that they're stable in the face of change. And so we can now reframe the question, can urban landscapes be resilient, stable, and beautiful? Is the pursuit for resilience consistent with the pursuit for stability? Which is a fundamental question. Um, to since Hollis, Carlos, the prophet uh, Hollis, the his theory, there's been a lot of excitement amongst planners, designers, ecologists in terms of trying to use resiliency theory to guide design and plan. Um, the concept of adaptive cycles is very, very crucial in understanding the role of resilience in uh, design and planning. Typically, um, when we look at the first 
four phases in this adaptive struggle. <clears throat> Usually, uh, typically, when the communities go through ecosystem development, they move from the pioneer phase to the growth phase, which is in the mature phase, which is always what we're trying to strive. It's a very stable phase because the biogeochemical cycles are very, very tight. It is a stable state. Resource consumption is efficient and so forth. And essentially, we're always trying to strive to design to maintain that state. It explains the reasons why, for example, we want to preserve mature hybrids and stuff like that because it provides that stability. Well, sometimes we do have disturbances that go on. And when those disturbances, for example, the big fire, we have a flood, a hurricane, it disrupts that particular ecosystem. And so the ecosystem goes through a, a period of a, a, a phase in which the elasticity is very loose. But sometimes, they're able to reorganize and sustain themselves. And in fact, move back to the initial states they're supposed to be. So essentially, the challenge for us then is being able to create, to develop ecosystems, <coughs> urban ecosystems that are able to maintain their stability, but yet they're elastic enough to be able to rebound when there are disturbances. And that is the challenge that we do have. Because in some ways, when you have a very stable ecosystem, it might be very rigid and not able to adjust to changes. So that you have a stable ecosystem that not necessarily mean that it's an adaptable system. <clears throat> so um, there has been a growing and robust set of concepts that have emerged that will enable, focus on enabling a, a system, urban ecosystems to adapt to change. Um, one set of concepts, I call them bridging concepts, focus on those dimensions of these theories, not just only resiliency theories, but theories of the world, that, that have relevance to guide action. I call, I call those uh, bridging concepts. The first of them is the fact that we should, a goal of urban design is to strive to manage predictable and unpredictable change. Predictable change is change that we normally address all the time. Unpredictable surprise are those kinds of changes that result from uh, you know, major uh, human disruptions and all that. Um, for us to be able to do that effect effectively, uh, we should focus on um, managing ecosystem services because in, in a way those services provide the elasticity that urban ecosystems need to rebound. It calls for coupling interventions for resilience and climate change. In part because climate change is one of the major causes of the disturbances that we're trying to deal with. And so uh, it is, I suggest that for you to deal with uh, a new design of a resilient system, you must really incorporate simultaneously the design for, um, the design for uh, climate change. It calls for diversity, diversity in all its forms, in terms of the learning platforms, in terms of institutions. It calls for experimentation, learning, and it calls for um, vast amounts of ambition, reasonably with social capital. So what I've tended after I've tried to do is to be able to just reorganize this uh, bridging concept into a series of principles that I want to share with you. The first is designing for change and uncertainty. It requires us to uh, organize space at the level of the first order, whereby you're just dealing with basic organization of space and infrastructure and the relationship between both. And that's where you stop. You allow the details to be, to be filled in over time. Um, you want, in the process also, you want to target critical uh, elements. For example, some of these elements, and Sprint calls them the deep structure of the landscape. What I'm talking about are those older elements of the landscape, the superficial geology, the bedrock geology, the, the uh, physiography, the hydrology. Those are the 
older elements of the landscape that change very slowly. And as such, we should build upon them in terms of being able to design for a certain thing. It suggests targeting certain critical ecosystem variables who have only limited resources and can only do so much. So for example, being able to target hydrological systems in flooded areas using uh, LID techniques and so forth. <coughs> um, it calls for integrating design and management protocols. I will come back to that later. And lastly, it calls for thinking in terms of the regional city. Cities are dependent on their hinterland for survival. So the residency <laughs> and sustainability of the city in part depends on those of the larger context. So that when we think of cities, we should think of not just the city, but the regional city. <clears throat> An example, when I talk about organization of the basic uh, space and infrastructure, this is exactly what I mean. Whereby you just lay the basic foundations and you stop there, you don't go further. And then what you then do is to establish performance-based design guidelines mm -hmm. that will fill in over time so that as change occurs, you can always modify the performance expectations. And then designers will then design things to fit the appropriate, the respond to the necessary needs. <clears throat> Conservation services. The capacity of cities to provide ecosystem services, especially in, um, in the face of climate change, is very critical to maintaining regenerative, adaptive places. I use the word adaptive sometimes interchangeably with resilient. So that is there. It is very, very critical. <clears throat> and these ecosystem services are those benefits we derive from ecosystems. The Millennium Ecosystem Classification identifies a number of them. They range from resource services to regulation services to uh, um, cultural services. But the critical point there is that it is these services that provide the filter that are essential and serve as buffers and provide elasticity for uh, uh, where there is a, a, a change in the landscape. And, and really, the ability to function in part depends on the quality of the, the ecological values. And so, <coughs> Essentially, the goal here, the target here, is to be able to conserve and, and those these critical ecosystems and their beauty, so to enable them to continue to serve the kinds of services we expect them to do. It calls for very closely monitoring cost-effect relationships. And ultimately, we have an obligation even though ecosystem services are those services that serve people, but we should go beyond the service to provide for people and think of it in terms of their long-term maintenance and their right to survival on their own. <clears throat> the, uh, the literature suggests very critically that preservation of ecosystem, preservation of ecosystem services requires uh, uh, that, uh, sorry, that climate change impacts the ability of those ecosystems to continue to provide the services. And so what it means that um, it suggests the need to integrate interventions for management of climate change with those for uh, uh, managing ecosystem services. There's a growing body of knowledge today on strategies for mitigating and coping with climate change. So that's not, I'm not going to that. The only point I want to make here is that it is critically important to integrate too. Secondly, um, when we think of regeneration, essentially what we're talking about is expansion of natural capital through active uh, restoration of ecological systems. In this diagram here, I'm trying to illustrate this, this dotted line indicates level of performance. Now, what I'm trying to show here is that, that the input in terms of maintaining the system 
after a while the climbs just as a matter of as a result of regular wear and tear and for the fact that sometimes the energy is a uh, 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 how many needs do I have there? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, just for the fact that it, it declines over time. And so to be able to maintain the same level of performance, you really have to increase energy input to be able to do that. What I'm suggesting here that if you embrace active regeneration as part of normal types of intervention you do, you may in fact create the possibility of bringing this up back to the level of performance. And so since in, in essentially what we're talking about here is being able to repair and renew this ecosystem so that they'll be able to maintain their adaptive capacities. So what I'm, I'm calling for permanently, permanently uh, <coughs> joining strategies for normal urban design with those for regeneration. And then making the design and uh, making both a, the, a goal of planning. Now, there are very, very robust, the body of knowledge on, uh, is growing in terms of the types of regeneration, regenerative strategies here. And so, and the list grows. So again, I'm, I'm not really here to suggest that you do this or do that, but I'm just saying that it is very, very critical to you know, couple them. And in the process of coupling them, then it suggests that, in fact, if you look at it, if you couple them together, then when there's, and it's actively, when there's a stress on the landscape, you're able to, ahead of time, accept a, a, a work in ways to repair that particular system. So you don't have to wait for something to happen before you go and do it. And so, um, and then uh, employing performance based measures become very, very critical so that you can understand exactly what is it that you're about, what is it that you're, you're, you're doing. <coughs> Um, resilient systems work best at regional scale. Um, the sources and support for employing regional scale come from very diverse sources. For example, from ecology, ecologists tell us that the regional scale is the most appropriate scale for attaining sustainability for a number of reasons. One, because of its large scale mass. Two, ecological processes change slowly. And three, it has a greater complementarity of resources. So collectively, that scale becomes critical. Um, at the early turn of the century, these regionalists, Patrick Giddings, Louis Mumford, Bente Marquet, they called for decentralizing cities to accommodate urban growth. And the ideas were quickly grabbed upon by you know, members of the Regional Planning Association of America. But over time, regionalism developed in divergent pathways from the regional science ideas of Walter Isaac to the ecological regionalism of Ian McCarg and to metropolitan regionalism as we see today, say, in uh, Portland, uh, uh, Oregon. But the focus on ecological regionalism en <coughs> enables, looks at the ethical foundation drawn from Leopold's work and views the region as an interactive mosaic of biological, physical, social, and cultural systems that provide opportunities and limitations. So emphasis here is on adaptation and this understanding then provides a broader framework within which we uh, design cities. Regional imagination suggests the need to develop a regional vision. Here in uh, Austin, I think Fritz will work on a vision central of Texas, which is an example of what I'm talking about. It provides the broader structure uh, and frames intervention that are caused at the city and at other special skills. It also um, focuses on the need to identify the regional essence of a place and to embrace that regional essence in terms of design at all special levels. 
importantly, it talks about the regional scene, the idea of it. Most of us will design for human experiences at a very, very small scale. But what this is saying, in effect, is that whenever the opportunity exists, we should try to connect, to connect to these connectors, because these are the processes and pathways for the flow of energy, mineral, species, and information across the landscape. Okay. So it is our responsibility. Sometimes it's called ecological networks, it's called green infrastructure, whatever. But the idea is to maintain them. They're very, very critical. And that is how individual we connect to the larger landscape. Whenever we think of design, we do design. One of the things we want to do is to ensure that our design intentions are fulfilled. Management provides a strategy for ensuring that it's done. But it is just a likelihood that the outcome might be exactly what you want. What I'm calling for here is that if you couple design and management together as a unified whole, it will increase the likelihood that the design intentions are actually realized. And in this case, management assumes a more creative role than is usually expected. In fact, John Lyle uh, talked about this relationship as an important feature of his, uh, of his design approach. Here, I say that it is a fundamental prerequisite for designing and maintaining adaptive, creative, uh, and regenerative landscapes. Let me illustrate. If you think of a typical design process here, drawing from the uh, uh, from public design workshop, we think in terms of working from generalities to specifics, in terms of drawing on knowledge from different sources and integrating those the knowledge through a series of processes to come to design development. Once we get here, we proceed to develop construction drawings and construction administration and also then implement the yeah. What I'm suggesting here is that at this point, this point here, management is introduced, a detailed management plan is introduced as part of that process. And so it is introduced and becomes part, so it's introduced, and, and there are two important features of that, the plan that needs to take place there. One is in terms of specific management activities you need to phase in the development over a long period of time, and then the day-to-day -day maintenance. And all those things, <coughs> and this is what I say, all those things then, by doing so, we strengthen the linkage between the design process and the implementation. And it suggests a need to rethink the way we actually do things and to make this, to advise our clients that this is what it ought to be if they truly want their designs to be implemented. So essentially, there are a number of implications here. One. But perhaps the most detailed implication is to develop an integrated design, management, construction protocol. And view all of them as an integrated whole. And so that when you create a budget for your client, it embraces all this. By doing so, it increases the likelihood that you actually undertake monitoring. Because it's already built into the project. In fact, I even go further to say, you know, um, um, that if, if you do so, then what you want to do is at the outset cut out some of the fronts, put it in some kind of a bank to make sure it's used for that particular purpose, just like you do in a mortgage, you know. <coughs> and it also uh, heightens the need to focus on performance expectations. Because it's very, very important. If, if we have to very, it would be very, very important for us to know what is, how are we currently performing? What is the anticipated level of performance? How do we know when we get there? What are those benchmarks that enable us to do? In the absence of that, basically, we'll just be doing things very loosely. Now, we're talking about performance. So the question is, what is performance? Um, quantitative data, 
about processes, services, and outputs of the system. The key is to be able to understand and manage those processes. So what we'll start dealing with things in terms of is the system doing what it's supposed to be doing? How well is it doing it? Is it doing very well? At what level of productivity? But essentially, it is comprised of two things, a number and a measurement. And in tropical in terms of landscape, the performance pertains to the health, functioning, and well-being of landscapes. Now, um, there's a growing body of uh, robust, uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, efforts recently through efforts such as league, um, sites, and landscape for foundation to be able to bring performance measures to the table in understanding how um, landscape perform. For example, landscape from uh, landscape of agriculture foundation talks about uh, measuring the efficiency and effectiveness within which landscape solutions fulfill their intended purpose. <clears throat> and they've done a lot of work. Going to many of you uh, here who are probably from there, but they've done a lot of work that begins to. Uh, uh, at least at some level articulate the performance measures of our design work. Mm -hmm. This is Millennium Park and there are many, many other examples. But the point I want to make here is that undertaking utilizing landscape performance measures is not very easy. Unlike building systems that are enclosed, landscapes are open interacting mosaic of ecosystems. And so sometimes those measurements are very, very difficult to do. But that should not stop us. As a matter of fact, it provides a very robust mm -hmm. area for research. Um, the critical point I want to make with respect to places is that the goal to transform landscapes into places that have meaning for the inhabitants. Um, places, place theory, place making, place strengthen, who have a very robust literature on that. So the point I'm trying to make here is that maintaining and creating places is essential in creating regenerative landscape because those affections, those bonds, those attachments that people hold in place is what essentially provides the elasticity that is essential in maintaining uh, urban landscapes. And thus, in fact, it has been found to be highly correlated with high massive inputs of uh, social capital. <clears throat> and so again, like I say, that's what we take away point here. It's very, very critical to maintain those places. So in conclusion, um, I've talked about a number of principles. But I think, importantly, the impact is in, is in their synergistic effects. Say, for example, I've talked about that in, in reality, you can, if you think about uh, conserving ecosystem service, you have to think of it in the regional context. Mm -hmm. And you cannot really think of a city without thinking of the regional city. And that uh, if indeed we're very, very serious about adaptation, adaptive landscapes, and all that, then we should embrace regeneration as an integral part of what we're doing all the time. And that what to be to be very effective, it has to be performance based. Places provide the elasticity we need in rebounding from change, particularly undesirable change. But it has <coughs> to embrace those essential qualities of American urbanism, the mix, diversity, connectivity, public realm. Because essentially, um, I'm very, very hopeful that we come up with solutions. But also, some of these propositions suggest uh, new areas of research and innovative practice that range from an aesthetic understanding of landscape to new theoretical approaches in understanding complex socio-ecological systems like cities, and being able to build a robust set of performance reliable performance indicators that actually help us to understand how well we're doing and how we want to proceed. And also, the need to learn from practice. Because ultimately, when we talk about creating resilient cities, we're not talking about regionalism or plant communities or whatever. We're talking about an integration 
of all to great places. <coughs> Thank you.